Yeah, I'll try to keep this one a little bit brief uh, here. Uh, it's a fascinating story, very interesting one. Not a very happy one, I'm afraid. But then again, Dorothy Parker's life wasn't terribly happy either. Um, she was a brilliant woman, um, part of the big uh, literary scene, the Algonquin uh, Round Table um, uh, there in New York. She um, was an extremely intelligent woman, very well read, hung out with all of the big writers of the period. I mean, all of the big names. Um, she was very uh, much in that milieu, that cultural milieu of the publishing and, and literary circles there in New York. And she was known for her unbelievably quick wit. I mean, just, just do an internet search of Dorothy Parker's famous quotes and sayings, and um, they're really fascinating. She was uh, just a sharp, sharp person. Um, unfortunately, um, she wrote some great works. This is a, a, a very moving piece as well, not very happy, um, as I said, but wrote some great literary works and was a brilliant literary critic, a very, very insightful literary critic. I mean, she knew good stuff from garbage uh, like nobody's business. I can tell you why. Uh, sadly, however, uh, alcoholism and bad relationships and probably, probably depression, I'm almost certain that that would be the case. And I mean, in those days, it wasn't diagnosed much. I mean, people didn't know why people behaved why they did. Um, but today, we, we, we know an awful lot more about it. She probably suffered from depression, and the alcohol was in part, you know, self-medication and that, that sort of thing. Ask anybody who's a therapist, and they can tell you a lot more than I can about that sort of thing. But, um, but she lived a very, very tragic life. Uh, the alcohol really took its toll on her. She tried to attempt suicide several times, um, and she sort of famously quipped, it's kind of dark, but it, it, this is her line, not mine, um, that I wasn't, a, I wasn't a big success in life, and I wasn't a very good success in death either. And that was because, of course, she tried to commit suicide and didn't succeed, like our character in this particular short story, right? Um, she was um, branded as being a communist, um, and was one. Uh, joined the American Communist Party and was pretty much blacklisted from everything after the war as a result of that. Um, she was kind of radioactive and untouchable in some respects. She ended up basically working in the basement of a department store as an older woman. Uh, didn't live terribly long, um, uh, but, um, you know, 74 years, um, but, uh, but ended up pretty much impoverished and living in a basement, uh, uh, working in the basement of a, of a department store, I, I forget which one, and did famously leave her estate, small as it was, to both Martin Luther King and the NAACP because she felt very strongly about social injustices and wanting to make sure that, that people were treated properly and that they had equal rights. So there are a lot of admirable things about her, but Boy, the life she led was a rough one and not a very happy one, and and uh, took its toll on her. Um, and this is not a very happy story. And so, but now I don't want you to go too far and think, well, this is all autobiographical because it it isn't. I don't. I think there are just some serious limits in trying to draw the lines between Parker herself and Hazel Morse in this story. But let's just take a look. I just want to um, sort of set the stage for you, and then we're going to continue the discussion of it online. I've got a couple of different uh, online. Uh, prompts that I hope you'll contribute to here. Um, the, the, uh, some themes that you'll see very much popping out of here if you, if you look carefully. Now, historically, this period of time, you've got to understand, was a radical revolutionary period of time for women. I mean, most of you probably know what flappers are, or at least have a concept of them. There's a little magazine cover there with flappers on it, and there's some on the bottom screen there, there, there's what some people would have considered flappers of the time. Um, some flamboyantly dressed, some not so flamboyantly dressed. If you look at the, uh, the, the girls in the middle of that photo, uh, they're a little bit less conservatively dressed than the one right next to her in the lighter colored dress. Um, but flappers weren't so much about you know, the beads, uh, the beaded necklace, and the short skirts, and uh, the sleeveless dresses, as it was about an attitude and about uh, kind of a uh, an approach to life. This is the first time that young women had a greater a modicum of independence. Um, the 1920s is what we're talking about here. Remember the 19th Amendment in 1920 gave women the right to vote. So um, you have this, that you're ushering in a period of time which I really, I, I don't know if you could call it feminist or not, you decide, but it certainly was a period where your average young woman who was college age, for example, 
could have a great deal more independence. Many of them were trying to pursue careers and who were not, who were determined not to be restricted or confined or defined by their mothers or grandfather, grandmothers' um, social mores. Um, they had different views on on marriage. They had different views on how they wanted to live their life. They had obviously different fashions. I mean, these, all the girls in that picture in the bottom there and the one in the, on the magazine cover are showing their ankles. Oh my gosh, how scandalous, right? But that was the big shift from Victorianism. The, pe uh, the young women in the 1920s especially threw off all of those old conventions. The way mom and grandma dressed is restrictive. It's not letting me be who I want to be. It's stifling me. And as a result, it is, um, you know, giving me um, a a real sense of of uh, not controlling my destiny in what I'm doing. Now, along with that, what you have is a reassessment, not just of the roles and the norms and, and such of young women, but also this reassessment of marriage. And, and we keep coming back to this, but it was really important. Um, you say, well, how long are we going to be talking about women and their attitudes towards marriage? Understand how important marriage was to a woman. I mean, as as a as a little girl, I mean, people would, and and even to this day, a lot a lot more with boys, you know, you know, a lot of who they were, their whole identity was wrapped up in who they would marry, and and the destiny that they saw for themselves was about domesticity, about motherhood and all those kinds of things. And this is the first period of time here where young women are really deciding, I don't know if I want to actually be married, or I don't know what kind of relationship I want to have. Um, this is the first period of time really when middle class and upper class, not, not working class, okay, because working class, this has always been the case, okay, but middle class and upper class women, at least a percentage of them, we're beginning to reassess, you know, issues of sexuality, okay? Now, what am I saying by that? Let me decode it, okay? Gee, back in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, whatever, working class women, you might say lower socioeconomic women, frequently would engage in mm, extramarital sexual relations, premarital pre sex. This was not uncommon. In fact, if you go back to colonial days, for example, the out-of-wedlock birth rate was phenomenally high in the late 1700s. It used to spike around the time when military exercises were done by the colonial militia. So guys, young, young men who would dress up in uniforms and go out and do military drills in certain towns, nine months later, lo and behold, there were a lot of un, unplanned pregnancies, okay? Um, so out-of-wedlock birth was fairly common um, among certain classes of people. But in the Victorian era, that began to be frowned on. It began to be looked at, as I said in class, as being something only low class people would do. And so sexual morality, sexual purities, abstinence was expected, particularly on the part of middle class and upper class women, like it would have been with Charlotte Temple, right? I mean, that was a family that was, um, you know, trying to hang on to middle class, upper middle class respectability. Getting pregnant outside of wedlock would have been something that was absolutely disastrous and shameful. Uh, among the lower classes and the working classes, the less educated, it was something that upper class people would say, well, what do you expect? You know, they're low class, right? Um, but they would be appalled at that sort of behavior among their own class. This period of time, the 1920s, a sort of sexual liberation was uh, taking hold w among some young women, um, uh, even though it wasn't sort of loudly broadcast, it was understood that that, and, and, and by the way, this was rather euphemistically called modern girls, right? Oh, she's a modern woman. And that carries with it sort of sort of political, social sort of implications. But from time to time, it also carried with it sort of a suggestion about her, you know, sexual um, promiscuity, if, if, if you look at it that way. That she was, she had more modern views of sexuality. Now, to us, we would probably look at it and say, "Holy cow, that's like radically sexually, you know, like she would kiss on the first date and all that kind of stuff, and be very flirty and wear sort of provocative outfits." Um, uh, that was considered to be pretty risque at the time, and to go out on their own and to date different men, that was pretty risque. What percentage of women actually engaged in sexual behavior pre? pre-wedlock, gosh, who knows, go do a census study, I couldn't tell you, probably not the majority, uh, but more than you would think, and absolutely more 
than in the Victorian age among middle class and upper class women. So, so you know, there was a lot of talk during the 1920s about the modern woman or modern girls, and you see that in this short story. Also, another thing that is that is brought up in the in the story really that doesn't get as much attention is the fact that Parker is at least addressing the question of depression, mental illness, mental decline, and, and embraces a, 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 a sort of gritty realism here that's very dark and pessimistic uh, about that. Um, I don't think that she is calling out for some sort of social agenda to be achieved here with respect to mental health or mental illness, but she's at least painting the picture very graphically and very realistically because she sort of lived through it. So let's talk briefly, and we're not going to go too long on this one, but I'll let you guys uh, kind of pick up the ball with the discussion. Let's talk very briefly about who Hazel Morris is and why she's living the way she is, because it, it seems to me that a major conundrum that Parker is dealing with here is this question of what do we do um, about you know, modern relationships and modern women, having achieved some level of emancipation, having achieved some level of autonomy, um, by no means what you would think of as autonomy today for young women, um, having achieved that, that now what, right? Um, so, okay, so young women have the ability and the choices to go and do some of these things. What do we do with that? And I don't want to read this as a morality tale because I don't think it is. I don't think Parker here is saying that choices lead to decline and, and death and unhappiness. But if you're free to live the way you want to, um, apart from as much stigma as was the case you know, eons ago, it it means that you now have to take charge of your life and do you have the tools to do that? Um, is there no other way for Hazel? I mean, she, she, she gets married and you, you hear early on, she says, um, Parker says, um, uh, men liked her and she took it for granted that the liking of many men was a desirable thing. That's a really interesting line. She took it for granted that that's what you're supposed to to, to, to want to have guys like you, but do you really have guys? Do you, do you really enjoy having guys like you? Well, I mean, you're supposed to enjoy it. Yeah, I guess I do. Kind of. Well, I mean, maybe. Right? She really doesn't have a a strong desire to be desired. You know, innately, she just thinks, well, that's what you're supposed to want, so I want it. Um, you're supposed to want a house and a car and 2.5 kids and a dog and a cat. Okay, so I guess I want it. Maybe. I don't know. I really haven't thought about it. This is not a young woman who, despite the greater freedoms of the era, has really thought through what it is she really wants out of the from that freedom or what she wants to use that freedom to do. She's left kind of unequipped to, to, uh, to decide what to do. So she here she is presented with choices and hasn't really thought very much about what she wants to do with her life. Well, they say you should get married, so I did. A guy asked me, and I did. Uh, reading further, popularity seemed to her to be worth all the work that had to be put into its achievement. Men liked you because you were fun, and when they liked you, they took you out, and there you were. Right? That's an interesting line, the way she puts it. It's as though Hazel doesn't really know what she wants in her life. She just knows what she's supposed to want and what people tell her makes her happy. Um, so, and successfully, she was fun. She was a good sport. Men liked a good sport, right? She was good at being popular with guys. And popularity is what she was told you ought to be, because that will make you happy. But if you ever cornered Hazel and said, but are you really and truly, honestly, and genuinely happy, she would probably look at you with a blank stare and say, I don't know what that is, right? So here we are with this period of time where young women are being given these options and choices, but no one's taken the time to sort of encourage them to figure out what is happiness for you, right? Um, and so uh, she goes through a series of relationships. She sort of doesn't even understand why her marriage falls apart. She says, one day I'm, 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 I'm happy and I think I am anyway. I, I like my home. I'm, I'm, I, I love living this lifestyle. I feel a sense of security and commitment and belonging and all these things. And then suddenly I wake up and it's like my husband doesn't like me anymore. And I don't, I don't understand what, when did that happen, 
right? It's like one day yes, and the other hot, and the other day cold, and then just suddenly bang, it's over. And then I'm tr- I'm miserable. She begins to drink very heavily. She always was kind of a party girl, but she begins to turn to alcohol for a very very different reason. Her husband obviously was always a huge heavy drinker, and he becomes bitter that she doesn't join him in these escapades. But she sees it as something that's not fun anymore. Right? She was a party girl, and when she was single and a party girl, she was having fun going out with the guys and enjoying herself, living sort of that flapper lifestyle. But now that she's married, she doesn't want that anymore. But her husband does, and he thinks she's really cramping his style. He keeps saying that she crabs and crabs and crabs and complains and everything, and is a bit of a nagger. He leaves, of course, and she goes through sort of a succession of different guys um, from across the hallway, the men who come over there and the, the you know Joe's boys and and all of those guys who hang out over there. And they're really just drinkers who have mistresses. Heavy drinkers who have mistresses. Salesmen who come into town and they visit and they give them money and whatnot. It's hard to say this, but there's a very fine line here between being someone's mistress and being someone's occasional prostitute. And she's living right there on that border on one side of the line or other. And the big sign that it's not so much... um, um, the former, but much more so the latter, is that she doesn't really have feelings for these men. She's fond of them. You know, she likes hanging out with them when they're in town, but she does not really have an emotional tie to them. She's emotionally very numb towards them. They provide for her. They give her money. They show her a good time. She's able to pay her bills like some of the other women that hang out over there. But ultimately, there's no feeling. There's no attachment for these guys at all. She can't even remember what sequence she had these boyfriends in, right? Oh, did Fred come before? Yeah, I think he came before the other guy, right? Um, That's how much they mean to her, basically, zilch. Um, And, of course, towards the end, she has a very sort of nihilistic view um, that She doesn't really believe in the afterlife. She doesn't really believe in anything other than just wanting to numb the pain and get rid of what she feels is a really tiresome thing, namely life, Um, and finds the idea of just perpetual, you know, sleep or suspended animation, which is kind of her concept of death, being far, far preferable to the misery of living as an alcoholic who can't seem to make human connections and who probably in my mind, I think, is suffering from serious depression. So this is a story in part about navigating modern life for a modern woman and and not having the ability to be, you know, equipped to deal with those choices, but also, you know, modernism having stripped away preconceived assumptions about the meaning and purpose of life it, it doesn't leave you very much. Remember, if you're trying to strip away the essentials of modern life um, to try to find out what's at its base or its core or its heart, you're stripping away some of the belief system that once existed. And if you're, you, you take that away, then what is left in its place to help one navigate the complexities of life? Not a lot. And if you don't encourage people to explore or consider or examine how to live one's life, What exactly do all those choices mean at that point? Interesting thing to ponder. I'm looking forward to seeing your discussions and kind of seeing what you have to say about it. There's no quiz on this one, um, but do contribute to the discussions if you can by Monday at midnight, and we'll pick up with uh, class as usual regularly on Tuesday.